on is on the issue on the governance, uh, the Center for Quality Assurance and Governance. Uh, there was a discussion on what the word governance uh, really means and the scope of uh, uh, this word as used in the uh, name of the office. And uh, it was, there was an agreement that uh, is on the inclusion of the word governance, governance and the uh, Institute for Quality, for quality, quality Governance. And and governance. In the uh, there was the discussion on what the to uh, the scope of the uh, uh, effort for diversity in the uh, uh, assurance of, and, uh, the, uh, of the different uh, uh, units or offices of governance, not only those for public under the government. And this discussion was a question whether this office, the very this office, will be properly. Uh,
Po, sir. Uh, we're gonna start the program in 10, 10 a.m. po. Good morning. Good morning po, sir. For the meantime po, sir, uh, relax po muna, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Good morning po, sir. 
Uh, we're gonna start the program in 10, 10 a.m. po. Good morning. Good morning po, sir. For the meantime po, sir, uh, relax po muna na, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Good morning po, sir. Uh, we're gonna start the program in 10, 10 a.m. po. Good morning. Good morning po, sir. For the meantime po, sir, uh, relax po muna na, sir. Okay, okay. Makachip pa ulit ulit. Good morning po, sir. Uh, we're gonna start the program in 10, 10 a.m. Good morning. Morning po, sir. For the meantime po, sir, uh, relax po muna na, sir. Okay, okay. Tignan yung, tignan mga narinig ko ulit. Narinig ka pa, no? Good morning po. Good morning. Kasi pa ulit ulit. Good morning. Subola, good morning. Good morning, ma. Narinig ka. Sabi. <laughs> For the meantime po, sir, uh, relax po muna na, sir. Okay, okay. Tignan yung, tignan mga narinig ko ulit. Narinig ako, no? Good morning po. Good morning. Kasi pa ulit ulit. Nakikinig. Subola, good morning. Good morning, ma. Narinig ka. Sabi. <laughs> For the meantime po, sir, uh, relax po muna na, sir. Okay, okay. Tignan yung, tignan mga narinig ako ulit. Narinig ako, no? Good morning po, good morning. Kasi pa ulit ulit. Nakikinig. Hola, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Narinig ka. Okay. <laughs> Pakitawag ng 284. Pakiyan na, pakiyan na, pakiyan na, pakitawag ng 284. Pakiyan na, 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 p
Pakitawag ng 284. Pakitawag ng 284. Pakitawag ng 284. Hello? Sorry mo sir, wag sa kanya. Salila ako. <laughs> Minumulto tayo. Mic test, mic. Mic test. Wala na, okay na. Yes! Accept na ako ng participant, sir. Participant ka muna.
pamantasang una ang pagmamalasaki. Today, the DOH uh, is reporting two additional confirmed cases of Nitong mga nakaraang buwan, humarap ang bansa at ang buong mundo sa isang pandemya. Nangangailangan ng mga bagong bayaning matapang nahaharap at tutugon sa mga pangangailangan ng komunidad. Isa ang Politeknikong Universidad ng Pilipinas na tumugon sa panawagan sa pag-aali ng malasakit sa kapwa. Ang PUP ay tumutugon sa pangangailangan na ating mga mahihirap na kabaranggay. Sa pangunguna ni PUP President Dr. Manuel M. Muhi, mga kaguruan, empleyado, alumni, at mga estudyante ay nagpahatid ang Universidad ng Pagmamalasakit sa iba't ibang paraan. Libo-libong mga frontliners ng ospital. Nakadistino sa mga karatig barangay. at police stations at mga tricycle at pedicab drivers ang nabigyan ng alcohol na locally produced ng Institute for Science and Technology Research. alcohol na ipinamamahagi namin sa <clears throat> mga tao dito kasi kailangan, kailangan natin ng alcohol. Yun ay kaloob din ng ating universidad sa nasasakupan ng barangay. Kaya ako, in behalf of my council, kami ay uh, nagpapasalamat ng marami sa ating universidad dahil uh, hindi tayo pinababayaan sa lahat ng lalo itong pagkakataon na to na talagang uh, lahat naman na kailangan ng tulong eh, nakita ko naman sa ating universidad ang magaling at mahusay ng pagsuporta sa ating pamilya. Sa panahon na hirap ang ating mga kababayang makatanggap ng tulong medikal, ay nabigyan ng psychological at medical assistance ang ilan sa mga miyembro ng universidad na nakaranas ng iba't ibang karamdaman noong nagsimula ang pagtaas ng kaso ng nasabing sakit sa bansa. Sama-sama rin binuo ng Medical Services Department at Facilities Management Office ang isang triage sa loob ng PUP sa Tamesa Campus para masigurado ang kaligtasan ng mga empleyado na papasok sa universidad. Bilang dagdag na proteksyon laban sa COVID-19 ay nagproduce din ang PUP ng face shields. Ito ay ipinamahagi sa iba't ibang ospital, opisina ng gobyerno, kalapit na barangay, Philippine Red Cross, at miyembro ng komunidad ng PUP. Hindi rin lingid sa kaalaman ng lahat na nang maipatupad ang Enhanced Community Quarantine o ECQ ay may mga estudyante na stranded sa kanika nilang dorm at hindi makauwi sa kanika niyang probinsya. Linggo-linggong ayuda mula sa iba't ibang benepisyaryo Maging sa bulsa ng mga empleyado at faculty members ang naipamigay sa mga nasabing estudyante. Una po sa lahat, anong kapasalamat po kami sa PUP kasi uh, malaking tulong po yung nabibigay nila sa amin na uh, bilang kami po ay hindi po nakakauwi. Natutulungan po nila kami sa aming pagkain sa araw-araw. Uh, every week po silang nagbibigay sa amin ng, uh, ng ayuda po, uh, lalo na po yung mga tao sa admin po. When the, the pandemic started, I didn't have food as well, but um, like this, when I do that, like BUP will distribute like this. food for uh, stranded uh, students from BUP. I was extremely excited and I felt really lucky. 
sa tulong din ng Armed Forces of the Philippines at iba pang ahensya ng gobyerno ay may naiuwi ring mga estudyante sa kanika nilang pamilya. to have us uh, finish every document to review our uh, student visa. After a few a few weeks, uh, we finished the, the document on my student visa. I, I received the news from Vietnam that they will send uh, a repatriation flight from the to, to, uh, to rescue Vietnamese people here. Sa darating na pasukan ay haharap ang buong universidad sa new normal. Sasalubungin ng mga estudyante, administrador at kaguroan ang tinatawag na FlexTel o Flexible Technology Enhanced Learning. Sinisigurado ng FlexTel na walang estudyante ang mapag-iiwanan sa pagbibigay ng kalidad na edukasyon. Sa FlexTel ay hindi lamang iisang forma ng delivery ang gagamitin ng mga kaguruan para masiguradong lahat ng estudyante kabilang sa iba't ibang antas ng lipunan ay makapag-aaral. Ilan dito ay ang Face-to-face -face learning sa panahon na maaari ng magbukas ang mga eskwelahan na sisiguraduhin ang kaligtasan ng mga estudyante at guro sa pamamagitan ng physical distancing, iba't ibang health and hygiene measures, bawas na bilang ng araw na pagpasok, at mas maliit na bilang ng estudyante sa classroom. Online na maaaring synchronous o asynchronous learning na re sa ekonomikal na kakayahan ng estudyante. At digital at off-grid na magpapadala ng instructional material sa mga estudyanteng walang gadget o walang kakayahang kumunek sa internet dahil sa ekonomikal na estado ng kanilang pamilya o lugar. Dinedevelop na rin ng mga kaguruan ang instructional materials para sa iba't ibang klase na tutugon sa pangangailangan ng mga estudyante sa new normal. Kabilang sa paghahanda ay ang pagmimintina ng mga classrooms, paglilinis ng mga pasilidad, at pag-conduct ng mga regular na meetings para sa development ng iba't ibang sektor. Kabila ng takot at pangamba, hindi tumitigil ang mga iskolar ng bayan para tulungan ng isa't isa. Tunay ngang kahit sa panahon ng panganib ay isinasa puso ng bawat PUP yan ang mga salita sa imno. Gagamitin ang karunungan mula sa iyo para sa bayan.
allow me to share with you my vision for the university. I envision PUP to become the pioneering and leading National Polytechnic University in the 21st century. With a National Polytechnic University status, it will bring more opportunities for the university to further strengthen its academic programs and improve organizational performance as an institution for higher education. In pursuit for this vision, my mission for PUP is for it to recognize its catalytic role for national development. PUP will ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities through a re-engineered polytechnic education. By re-engineering, we look into the existing processes and programs in order to achieve higher quality of academic programs and services following the principles of effectiveness and efficiency. With this mission in mind, I have formulated 10 pillars as my reform agenda for the university. Pillar 1, Dynamic, Transformational, and Responsible Leadership. Empower academic and administrative leaders by following the core principles of good governance to create collective growth and unity. Here I would like to highlight an innovation by introducing the development of an integrity management plan to assess, plan, and implement anti-corruption strategies that will secure the institution against corruption and abuse. Likewise, asset management and resource generation will be aggressively pursued to ensure productivity and finance the implementation of the plans and projects for the university. Pillar 2, Responsive and Innovative Curricula and Instruction. We aim to provide world-class polytechnic education that responds to national and global needs by developing intellectually challenging curricula and design academic programs that are based on industry demands to provide the learners with adequate and relevant competencies and skills and prepare them for a successful and rewarding careers. In a rapidly changing world, we recognize the paradigm shift in curriculum to outcome-based education with lifelong learning approach. Pillar 2 also sits on the framework of internationalization of Philippine higher education through transnational education by promoting academic mobility among faculty and students and global dimension into the curricula and teaching process. Pillar 3, Enabling and Productive Learning Environment. Following Education in Industry 4.0, we aim to increase and enhance the use of new technology to enable student learning and engagement as well as advanced teaching process and methodology through new and state-of-the-art facilities that will support the overall learning and teaching experience in the university. Pillar 3 likewise includes campus development and the provision of conducive learning centers and facilities for students and faculty. Pillar 4, Holistic Student Development and Engagement. We will empower students as well as rounded learners and active young leaders as we open opportunities for various academic mobility and venues for honing skills and personal development, being the principal stakeholder of the university. Recognize academic freedom as a form of self-expression and a platform to showcase students' intellect, skills, and creativity. Pillar 5, Empowered Faculty Members and Employees. Likewise, we are looking into the holistic development of our faculty and employees as productive, competent, and experts in their respective fields. We will encourage our faculty roster through formal education capacity building, research and extension initiatives, faculty immersion, and other academic engagements, right. both local and abroad. Right. We will ensure that both our faculty and employees will have a vibrant career development path right. as public servants in this state university. Right. Pillar 6, vigorous research production and utilization. Right. Yes. We will continue to strengthen the research culture in the university 
by promoting discovery and innovation through increasing disciplinary and collaborative research integration across academic disciplines to create new knowledge, utilize research findings, and develop innovative products. Pillar 7. Global Academic Standards and Excellence. Achieve the highest levels of recognition in quality and compliance standards from CHED, AACUP, and other international accrediting and regulatory bodies for higher education. We will intensify our efforts to achieve and sustain better academic performance and continue to excel as a top performing school in various professional licensure examinations and produce board top notchers as well as sustain our status of being the most preferred graduates of employers. Likewise, we aim to establish and to be recognized as centers of development and excellence in our academic programs. Pillar 8, Synergistic, Productive Strategic Networks and Partnerships. Synergize and force strategic linkages in partnerships across all sectors of society and the global community in line with the overall plans and programs of the university. Establish alliance with the government, industry sector, NGOs, and the academe will lead to resource sharing, program support, and research collaborations beneficial for all. Pillar 9, Active and Sustained Stakeholders Engagement. Harness a healthy and harmonious organization by empowering all its stakeholders, both internal and external, through open communication networks, consultative and participative undertakings, and team building activities, recognizing that all stakeholders can greatly contribute towards the betterment of the university. Pillar 10, Sustainable Social Development Programs and Projects. Expand access to education knowledge building, and information dissemination through sharing of expertise and resources for community development, support inclusivity approach and education by embarking on education on wheels, which aims to bring access to education closer to communities, following the principle of no one will be left behind. As the University of the People, we should bring the university closer to their hearts to serve their needs and extend assistance in mainstreaming public service. Our institution must continue to stand as one for the values that we have inculcated. For the past 115 years, we have exemplified our quest for truth, excellence, equity, relevance, effectiveness, integrity, and academic freedom. Lastly, I call upon each and everyone to join me in this journey. Together we stand as one para sa sintang paralan para sa ating bayan. Mic test. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Polytechnic University of the Philippines Professorial Chairholder Lecture Series 2020. Um, before we start, let us first invite the presence of our Lord through the doxology and refuel our vow and devotion to be a productive citizen of our country through the singing of the Philippine National Anthem.
Noon pa man, malaki na ang naging bahagi ng mga kababaihan sa lipunang Pilipino. Kaisa sila sa marubdob na paghahangad ng kalayaan ng ating lahi. Kabilang sila sa paglinang ng ating makulay na sining at mayamang kultura. Kasapi sila sa pagtataguyod ng mga adhikain ng kapwa mamamayan at sa pagtugon sa mga pangangailangan ng lipunan. Katuwang sila sa pagtuklas sa mga larangan ng agham at medisina. Kapanalig sila sa pagpapairal ng batas, karapatan at katarungan para sa lahat. Kabahagi sila sa paglilingkod sa bayan at sa pagpapanatili ng demokrasyang Pilipino. Sa paglipas ng panahon, hindi nagmaliw ang kanilang pag-ibig sa ating inang bayan. Mga kababayan, ito ang alay ng mga kababaihang Pilipino para sa bayan. Tumayo po tayong lahat at sabay-sabay nating awitin ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Good morning po again to everyone. Um, I believe that etiquette. I believe that the topic for today for the first professorial lecture series is interesting at the same time timely, especially for the academic sector in this time of pandemic. But before that, um, we would like the webinar to be conducive to everyone. So we request everyone to adhere to the following virtual conference etiquette. First is change room, your Zoom meeting ID to this format, acronym of the institution you are affiliated with, full name, example, PUP, Juan de la Cruz. Otherwise, you may use your full name as meeting ID. Remember that your microphone and video camera are disabled by default. You may enable them if it's your turn to interact. Also, be respectful. Don't interrupt the presenter and keep your mic on mute and camera off while someone is presenting to avoid unnecessary distractions. Be an active participant. Provide inputs and respond to the speaker's requests for comments cannot. or questions. Next. Questions and clarifications will be entertained after the presentation. You may use the chat box for the facilitators to note them. State your name and institution and ask questions concisely. Comments that will benefit yeah, others are most welcome. Provide feedback, help us improve our online events to better understand your needs and preferences. For our registered participants who are on Facebook, make sure that you You have answered the survey feedback to ensure that you will receive an e-certificate. Whenever disconnected to in the Zoom meeting, please log in again using the link or you may join us at facebook.com slash alumni official. So to formally start our webinar for today, let us welcome the chair, the committee chair of the professorial chairholder Committee Engineer Florinda H. Okindo. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Vice President for Academic Affairs, who is now uh, attending an equally important event, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, 
Professorial Chairholder Lecture Series, Session 3. So to our speaker, to all the participants, uh, I hope uh, you will gain a lot for this uh, morning event. Um, to Dr. Uh, Christian Endela, who will be uh, discussing about uh, enhancing engineering education uh, through simulation-based learning. So, sir, thank you for sharing your expertise. So, without further ado, so I welcome you all to this um, professorial lecture series. And then um, I hope you will enjoy the rest of the day. So, with Cadence in my heart again, good morning. Thank you, Engineer Apindo. Our professorial chairholder for today is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from St. Louis University in Baguio City, Philippines. He also took his Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering, major in Machine Design from the, the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City, Philippines. Then he took his Doctor of Philosophy in Engineering Mechanics at the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. He also has a University of Glasgow Singapore Leadership Development Program in 2015, an Executive Certificate in Leadership and People Management in 2017, both from S Singapore Management and U University, and a Postgraduate Certificate in Academic Practice from the University of Glasgow, UK. He is a Fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the United Kingdom, he got a certificate in university teaching from the University of Newcastle, Australia. He is a Six Sigma Green Belt from Business Technology R&D in Singapore and a Design for Quality and Reliability certificate also from the Business Technology R&D Singapore. His research interests are applied computational mechanics for mechanical design, composite materials and structure, piezoelectric composites for biomedical engineering application and engineering education. He is a well-published research author who presented his works through various research conferences. He also had done various academic lectures and trainings with specialization on simulation-driven engineering. Among his long list of professorial exper professional experience is being consultant of Principia Engineering Technology Center, Philippines from January 2018 up to this day. He's also a professorial lecturer at the Department of Me Mechanical Engineering at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, teaching finite element analysis and machine design for undergrad student and advanced machine design to graduate student from January to July 2019 and January 2020 to present. He is currently an assistant professor at the University of Glasgow, Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Christian N. Dahlia. Sir? Thank you very much for that uh, very um, flattering introduction, uh, Sir Orland. Um, and uh, to the uh, participants, uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I would like to start now my uh, presentation and uh, I wouldn't really um, talk about myself at the moment because Sir Orly already has uh, already mentioned some of my ac accomplishments. And uh, basically, I know a lot of Filipinos out there who are actually uh, even doing better. So let me start with my uh, presentation. So I'm sharing my slides now. There. Um, again, good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk. Um, the title of my talk is Enhancing Engineering Education Through Simulation-Based Learning. So I'm currently an assistant professor for the School of Engineering uh, for the University of Glasgow, UK, and I'm currently based in Singapore for our mechanical and mechatronics programs. At the same time, I'm also um, an industrial liaison officer for the University of Glasgow, Singapore, uh, trying to connect our academic practice with the uh, application to industry. 
Now, just a brief of introduction to our university. Uh, this was established in 1451. It's one of the top 100 universities in the world. We are connected to seven Nobel laureates. And um, as a mechanical engineer, I'm also proud that the university is connected to famous uh, people in mechanical engineering, namely Lord Kelvin. We have professor um, and, and we have um, engineer James Watt who has developed the Watt engine that uh, basically started the revolution. So um, for the outline of my uh, talk, I'm going to start with industry 4.0. Um, I'm going to give a bit of uh, discussion on simulation and digital twin. Um, I will be talking too about the two major contributors to our economy in the Philippines, that is the OFW, focusing more on the professional OFWs and the engineering services outsourcing. Then finally, I will be discussing how we can integrate simulation in our engineering curriculum. So for the fourth industrial revolution, um, like I mentioned, uh, the University of Glasgow is connected or uh, James Watt was connected with the University of Glasgow and uh, pretty, uh, pretty much his uh, work was uh, the one that started the industry revolution in the, the late 1800s. So we see production to be powered by uh, steam engines then. So that was the first industrial revolution. The second industrial revolution, because of the uh, concepts of mass production, as well as the electricity, we see the production and manufacturing to be improving. So we also see now that, uh, oh, sorry for that. So we also see that in the third industrial revolution, we see manufacturing and automation through the use of the computers and IT. So uh, a lot of um, industries at the moment are still in industry uh, 3.0. So what about industry 4.0? We see now industry 4.0 to be that merging of real and virtual worlds looking into intelligent manufacturing. So as we can see here, we see that there's a continuous de development and improvement of manufacturing systems and processes. Now, the question is, um, are we really, or are many countries really into industry 4.0? Well, not really. At the moment, they're still trying to convert the industry 3.0 concepts to industry 4.0. Some would even go to as early as industry 2.0, converting that to industry 4.0. So basically, Industry 4.0 is still a concept. We really cannot say that there are already countries out there who are industry, uh, who are implementing the concepts of industry 4.0, 100%. There are actually nine technologies that has been identified by Boston Consulting Group that's uh, transforming industry 4.0. We probably are already familiar with the 3D modeling, that is the CAD modeling, and I think that's already well incorporated in our curriculum, engineering curriculum. Um, what we probably need to grow, uh, aside from, of course, the other uh, technologies mentioned here, because it's my specialization, is uh, simulation. So I'm pushing for the growth of simulation in our country. And I know that there are also others there who are also push, pushing for the integration of simulation in our curriculum in the Philippines. Now, when I say simulation, uh, being an engineer, I am uh, focusing more on the finite element analysis that focus more on solids and the computational fluid dynamics, uh, which definitely uh, focus more on fluid flows. Now, there are many applications of finite element analysis. So we see aerospace applications, uh, we see uh, shipping industries, we see automotive uh, industries, as well as uh, high performance structures such as the bridges. Now, in um, the development of the Boeing 777, they basically used a finite element analysis or in general simulation in each part of the Boeing 777 before it was a prototype. 
or before a physical prototype was done. And actually this really saves Boeing uh, a lot of time as well as a lot of money to be able to develop this Boeing 777. We have the um, Airbus 380 to have extensively used the computational fluid dynamics uh, as well as finite element analysis to be able to develop the A380 Airbus. So as we know, this one is still uh, the largest um, still the largest uh, commercial aircraft uh, at the moment. Well, it's not basically uh, profitable at the moment, but we know that uh, through the use of the uh, technologies like CFD and FEA, they were able to successfully develop this huge airplane. Now, furthermore, on CFD applications, we can actually use them for um, external flow analysis external flow in buildings, as well as uh, internal flows. Uh, say on my left side here, you're looking at the condition of ventilation inside the room. Now, there are some countries out there that they won't even accept biddings without even this CFD, external and internal CFD analysis of the project. So that is just by bidding alone. Um, to your right, this is the ATF bar barrier study, the CFD study that our group uh, in the Philippine Society of Mechanical Engineers um, uh, analyzed so that we will be able to help support the uh, decision by MMDA as well as the IATF uh, when it comes to the use of the uh, ATF proposed barriers. And I think we were quite successful in there because for some reason we were able to uh, influence the decision of uh, AATF. Now, um, CFD can also be used in um, the weather applications, nature. So if you try to look at it, PAGASA is uh, using a simulation to be able to uh, predict the uh, behavior of the uh, typhoons or the storms. And that really helped a lot because that uh, helps us prepare. Um, this one, CFD, can also be used to study the flow of the rivers as well as the dam, as well as the temperature uh, in various uh, locations. Now, uh, simulation is basically revol evolving, that is, sorry. Um, simulation is evolving. So um, instead of just pure simulation now, we're looking at a digital twin, meaning that this, there will be a digital twin of a physical, uh, mechanical, or civil structure, or the process itself. So this digital twin is basically a seamless integration of the 4.0 technologies. We are already familiar with CAD and simulation um, because these are basically some of the parts or some of the important concepts in a digital twin. But basically, simulation is a core functionality of the systems by, mean of, by means of seamless assistance along the entire cycle of the digital twin. And why is this relevant? This digital twin market is expected to grow to over $15 billion by 2023. So this one is the global market. And this was done by uh, a European company um, looking into the um, applications of digital twin as part of uh, industry 4.0. What is digital twin? So the digital twin um, includes a physical twin where we have uh, we are able to uh, determine its performance using uh, measurements. So this is the physical system. And uh, we have a digital twin of that system. Hopefully 100% digital copy of that digital twin. So this is going to give us the performance of this physical twin because sometimes we won't be able to access information in the physical twin. And as engineers, we have to estimate as accurate as possible what's going on. So from the physical twin, the data, as well as the events, the actions um, that's happening on the physical twin can be transferred to the digital twin. So the digital twin using our knowledge in simulation and analysis will determine its um, uh, performance as well as its behavior. And from here, it's going to uh, provide inputs such as recommendations and adjustments and uh, probably some preventive maintenance schedule so that we will be able to have the physical twin performing at its um, uh, intended purpose. 
there are already many uh, digital twin concepts presented out there. So this one has to do with production. Um, this also has to do with mobility as well as offshore structures. And of course, we see uh, below, uh, to your right uh, below, uh, you will see that there will also be, or there are some concepts out there already for uh, wind turbines that are located uh, offshore. And definitely they are difficult to access uh, during extreme weather. So a digital twin definitely is going to help uh, assess our, um, to assess the uh, wind turbines uh, that has been installed offshore. Now, since we're looking at engineering education, that um, concepts on digital twin may be a bit advanced. So let's go to the basics. Let's have a look at my uh, single cylinder engine. Uh, let's assume that to my left or to your left is a physical twin and to your right is the uh, digital twin. When the physical twin is operating, we will be able to see the stresses and deformation that's acting on our structure or our mechanical component. So from here, we will be able to come up with a decision saying that probably we need to reduce the load because the stresses are too high. Or if there will be a scheduled maintenance, we probably will be able to adjust that a preventive maintenance schedule. So this one is basically um, a simple concept of the digital twin. So moving forward, um, that is a simple um, finite element analysis. Now, we can also look at the fluid structure interaction, meaning a combination of the computational fluid dynamics, as well as the finite element analysis. So in this case, we have a um, eco hydroelectric turbine. We see that the fluid is going to hit on the propeller. And from here, we will be able to determine the stresses acting on the propeller as well as its deformation. And then from there, we will be able to know whether our uh, component or material is safe during its operation. If it's not, then we probably need to adjust somewhere so that the um, so that our uh, hydroelectric turbine will be safe during the operation. Now, why simulation? So we know that Philippines now is really pushing for innovation. Uh, PUP, Philipp Polytechnic University of the Philippines, is also pushing for innovation. Now, let's have a look at what Thomas Edison have mentioned before. So he mentioned that if I find 10,000 ways something won't work, I haven't failed, I am not discouraged because every wrong attempt discarded is another step forward. So the genius is 1% inspiration and 99% inspiration. But nowadays at 10,000 ways of doing can be very expensive, although not impossible, but it can be very expensive and uh, very uh, time consuming. So probably we can say now that the innovation is 1% inspiration and 99% simulation because simulation can actually reduce the cost of innovation as well as the time needed to innovate. Now, why simulation too? We, we know that, um, well, as engineers, we know that anything that can go wrong will be wrong, will go wrong. That is from the Murphy's law. And of course, before we even um, do the physical thing, we probably will need to have an information on what's going to happen. So simulation really gives us that um, information so we can come up with a good or uh, excellent engineering decision. Now let's look at the graduate employment. Um, what are the main, main contributions to the Philippine economy? Of course, as we know, um, we have the versus Filipino workers, which is uh, still the top contributor to the contributor to the Philippine economy. Uh, we have the business process outsourcing. Um, what we know at the moment, or what would be more famous at the moment in the Philippines, and a major contributor is the call center business process outsourcing, and we see an emerging engineering services outsourcing. Uh, we see construction to be 
um, one of the major contribution at, contributor at the moment. Uh, we see manufacturing. Hopefully this one will grow in the future, but this has been stagnant for quite some time. And we see agriculture and uh, we, we see a lot of um, uh, discussions on improving or um, uh, making agriculture in the Philippines more high tech because uh, we have experienced this uh, COVID pandemic and uh, it probably gives us, gave us the opportunity to look into uh, agriculture into, uh, uh, in, in detail. Um, I'm going to look at the contributions of the OFWs to the Philippine economy. Now, this one is coming from a remittance company, and probably they will be the expert there because this is their business. Uh, as you can see, in 2018, um, the remittance inflow to the Philippines in U.S. billion dollars is $33.83 billion. And uh, we see that uh, for some reason, I'm uh, quite being... Um, a positive about this one saying that about 50% of those profession or that contribution will be coming from professionals uh, coming from the, the graph of the um, that remittance company or their study. Now, also from their study is that they mentioned that the North and South America accounts for only 5% of the OFW population, but they have the highest remittance to the Philippines uh, by country. So that is about eight. $11 billion. Uh, this is followed by UAE, um, which is 4 billion, Saudi Arabia, and Canada. Um, but if we try to look uh, in depth or in detail, we see that the United States and Canada combined contribute about 40% of the total remittances received. So that's um, quite a lot for uh, just two countries. Now let's look at this study done by the uh, DOST. So this was the uh, migration from 1988 to 2013. Uh, this was the latest information I was able to get. But if you have something new, probably that will be, I will be um, thankful if you can share it. So we see this uh, science and technology migration. Um, we have the nursing, of course, to be the top. Uh, next will be the civil engineer, uh, civil engineers. Um, we have those uh, teachers, our um, teachers who have been doing their job in the Philippines, but uh, to be honest, uh, in as much as we would like them to stay, um, they still would like to improve their lives as well as um, the lives of their family. So we see also the next one here, we see a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, which is number four. Number five will be uh, Electrical Engineering. And then we have others, uh, Bachelor of Science, Computer, uh, Bachelor of uh, Science in Computer Science and so on. All right, and this is not my data. This is the data coming from the OSD. So let's further, let's have a look further. Uh, where are these professionals uh, migrating to? Of course, U.S. will still be uh, the number one, um, uh, the number one um, country where our science and technology professionals would like to migrate to. Next, we have Canada. So, as we have mentioned earlier, um, the uh, remittance inflow from Canada and U.S. is already about forty percent of the total remittances. And then uh, we have the third one here to be Australia. That's uh, quite a huge contribution. So uh, probably we're suspecting now that, that this major contribution of OF, OFWs or one of the, the major contributions of OFWs will be coming from our science and technology uh, professionals. Um, well, of course, since we're engineers, we probably will just say, yeah, we have uh, contributed a lot to uh, this um, inflows as well. Now, uh, this one is uh, still a data from science and technology um, professionals from the study of DOST. So we see that about 42% of Filipino professionals working abroad are science and technology degree holders. Uh, most of them will be in the US, Canada, and Australia. So BS nursing uh, to be on top of the list, followed by a Bachelor of Science Engineering courses. So US being the preferred uh, country of destination by the majority. So Canada ranks second and followed by Australia. 
So looking at uh, this data, we see that the um, movement of Filipinos or Filip professionals, Filipino professionals to other countries will continue to rise and has even expanded to other countries. Skilled migrants move abroad for better pay, environment, improve lives and to help their families. So the Philippine labor migration policy has historically focused on removing the barriers for migrant workers to increase accessibility for employment abroad to help stimulate the country's economy. Moreover, the lack of employment opportunities in the Philippines has led to many individuals of working age to leave the country, either on permanent, temporary, or as an irregular migrants. The question now is, um, the government is helping them, um, removing the barriers for them to be able to work overseas. So since we are working in engineering education, what can we do? Are we equipping them with the right skills relevant to the current need of the industry? Or are we still back in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, where we don't really have any significant changes in our engineering education? So that's probably one of the questions that we need to address. So uh, let me have a look at the engineering services outsourcing. So this one is uh, a data from the Bureau of the Investment. So that's a government agency in the Philippines. So we have here the Information Technology and Business Project Process Management or the ITBTM. So in 2015, the sector generated 166 billion US dollars in revenue globally and is forecasted to increase to 250 billion by 2020. So these are some of the high value services, engineering services, outsourcing, uh, data analytics, performance management, legal process outsourcing. And when it comes to the leaders of the IT business uh, process management, we see India and the Philippines to be leading. Um, when it comes to engineering services outsourcing, of course, we are still far from India, but I, I really hope that we can do some part there to be able to uh, help uh, increase the competency of our uh, Filipino engineers to be able to grow this engineering services outsourcing industry. So this engineering services outsourcing industry makes up almost 55% 55, 55 of the global ITBTM market. Now, uh, engineering services outsourcing refers to outsourcing of work related to design and development. So we see this one to be um, related to drafting 3D modeling, engineering analysis, product design and testing, design automation, control system engineering, manufacturing engineering, embedded systems, and we have plant design and uh, or process engineering. So again, this engineering services outsourcing makes up to almost 55% of the global ITB BPM market, which is projected to reach $22 billion globally. Now let's look at the um, engineering design. Uh, this was a data from uh, a study in India. Uh, back then in 20, 2006 and 2011, the engineering design is, uh, 2006 is 315 million US dollars uh, after four years this grew to 1 billion US dollars. And basically if uh, the data is true, and I know that it's true, we know that the engineering services is led by both India and the Philippines. So we basically don't want to lose this advantage of ours. Uh, of course, we know that our engineers in the Philippines are really very good. Um, and then we speak the uh, English language. We can, uh, we can write as well as uh, speak in English. And there is that level of complexity in the uh, knowledge process outsourcing or engineering services outsourcing. So for engineering design, that is basic CAD. Um, we have the modeling analysis, a tool design. So this one already probably will look into simulation and then we have the concept generation development. So we will see that the um, complexity increases uh, upwards. So from basic CAD to modeling to concept generation. 
And uh, our challenges in the Philippines is, of course, our infrastructure, um, our skills. Um, we know that we're really good in CAD already, but it's really important that we have to consider growing our skills or improving our skills in finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics. Uh, and then uh, we should uh, at least have that mindset. Uh, our education system, our culture have developed us to be very good followers. There is no question about that, but what about as leaders? We have to think about uh, how we can uh, create more leaders if we really want to have more innovation. And of course, uh, we should address this ease of doing business. There are many uh, international service outsourcing in the Philippines already. Um, these are just a few. This is just a few of the uh, list of um, engineering services outsourcing. Uh, there are many actually from my uh, research and I see them to be growing at the moment. So I really hope that uh, we can supply the needs of that engineering services outsourcing in the Philippines. So moving forward, um, this one is the skills complexity from CAD migration drawing to the, to the 3D drafting, to conceptual design analysis, to pretty much ownership of the design and manufacturing. And then we have the uh, process improvement, quality consulting and e-engineering solutions. So this is the skills complexity of engineering services outsourcing. Um, in the Philippines, we are still in the entry stage of the engineering services complexity spectrum. So this one is a study from the uh, Department of Trade and Industry in the Philippines. So we're still there. And probably with that improvement in our engineering curriculum, we probably will be able to address uh, maybe the second and the third step and then probably grow to the uh, fourth and fifth uh, complexity in the uh, area of engineering services outsourcing. Now, this was also determined by, or this was also studied by uh, the DTI. So these are the key factors for um, company choosing an engineering services outsourcing destination. This is from a business perspective. So we have the cost, of course, in the Philippines, we know uh, many uh, international companies would like to invest in the Philippines because of one, the cost. Um, we have the quality to be one of the considerations of the skills as well as the um, degree of customer orientation. We have the business environment. We have the talent pool and future readiness as well as the infrastructure. I probably will discuss something that probably I can um, be able to contribute a bit. That is um, the quality of the uh, science education as well as the talent pool. So this will be the availability of scientists and engineers um, of course, the uh, tertiary education and, of course, the quality of the research, as well as specialty, uh, specialized training courses that's uh, going to help our uh, engineering professionals further improve their competency and be um, relevant to the current industry. So uh, this was, again, still a study of the Department of Trade and Industry uh, about um, the talent pool development and reskilling. Um, there is that uh, short-term uh, suggestion, recommendation, and there's that uh, mid-long-term uh, contribution. As an educational institution, uh, probably these are the areas that's going to be relevant to us, upgrading our curriculum so that the skills that our graduates will learn will be relevant to the industry. It's not something that's relevant to the 80s, but probably relevant to the 2020s, where we are at the moment and probably also prepare them for the future. So the long-term recommendation is to improve the quality of education in the country. Focus more on technical and engineering skills that will be relevant to the current need of the industry, to this generation, not the generation in the 80s. Now, what do we need to know? We know that uh, in the university, the students will already get this strong foundation in engineering science. I have no question on the, uh, on the um, quality of foundation in, of engineering in the Philippines. Um, 
I'm, I was educated in the Philippines in my undergraduate and master's, so I know the quality. Um, a comment by one of the visitors then from the University of Glasgow, where I was able to initiate the visit of University of Glasgow management to the Philippines then. Um, the comment then was, uh, there is no lack of talent in the Philippines. We just need some guidance somewhere. We need to um, have some benchmarking and we should not be benchmarking ourselves with our peers. We should be benchmarking ourselves with international standards. Okay. So uh, we should also be familiar with the CAD tools. Now engineers really need this one now. Um, and I think, I believe that many universities have already incorporate, incorporated this one in their curriculum. So I don't really see any problem with this one. We see those engineering services outsourcing to be employing many of our engineers to simply develop CAD models, but we probably can do better than this one. Uh, now, next will be the understanding of computational uh, methods, that is uh, finite elements and computational fluid dynamics. Um, we can incorporate this one, but of course, for undergraduate education, we really cannot um, really give um, too much mathematics uh, when it comes to uh, computational methods, because we have to admit it, they're still uh, trying to learn the fundamentals of engineering. So we really cannot give too much, probably in the master's and uh, the PhD if that opportunity arises. But uh, I think it's just good enough to just uh, let them know of the basics of FEA and the CFD. And with this one, it's really uh, important to also let them understand or uh, make them aware on the use of the tools on simulation. Um, there are many tools out there, uh, commercial and open source. So the commercial can be ANSYS, Abacus, SOLIDWORKS. I know some universities already in the Philippines who are using SOLIDWORKS. Um, we have Nastran. This is uh, pretty much used for the aerospace industry. Um, we have SimScale and we have OpenFoam, which is an open source CFD software. So aside from the knowledge of computational methods, it will be good for the um, engineering graduates to have an understanding on the proper use of simulation softwares or simulation tools. Now, after that, I think, uh, I hope I was convinced. I, I hope that I convince you that there is a need to incorporate a finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics in our engineering curriculum. One, of course, to support the um, economy of the Philippines. Of course, uh, we see the major contributors to be the uh, professional OFWs, as well as the engineering services outsourcing. These are the top two uh, contributors to our engineering economy, or sorry, to our Philippine economy. Okay, and I hope that with this one, we can now discuss incorporating the um, simulation in our curriculum. Now, there was this talk by, or a presentation by Professor Rajesh Bashkaran, who's a professor in the uh, Cornell University, so he gave this presentation in the uh, MIT, or he gave this presentation in MIT. His discussion was the new paradigm in engineering education. And he mentioned that his, to him, the two disruptive technologies will be simulations and online learning. Well, um, thanks to the COVID pandemic, so I'm not really thinking the COVID pandemic, but I'm thinking uh, the COVID because it has accelerated our, um, our transformation to be a digital learners. Uh, that is um, accepting online or flexible learning as one of the means of having quality education. So we probably need to focus more on integrating simulation in our engineering curriculum. Let me just discuss a bit of literature review. Now, in the literature, they have mentioned that modeling and simulation techniques have become common in modern engineering practice. Modeling and simulation have been integrated in engineering courses for students to gradually develop their skills and competence in modeling and simulation and prepare them for the workplace. Modeling and simulation for some universities overseas have been integrated in teaching mechanical 
and civil engineering courses such as basic mechanics. So what are the importance of integrating simulation in the engineering curriculum? Is it because it's just a trend? But I was um, mentioning earlier that because we have this uh, concern on supporting our professional OFWs and um, the, we need to support the engineering services outsourcing in the Philippines that motivates us to integrate simulation in our engineering curriculum. So it has been proven that a simulation has enhanced the learning of civil engineering and mechanical engineering courses, such as mechanics of deformable bodies um, through the use of FEA models or CFD models. The students can also visualize the deformation and stress contours within the structural members. Now, early exposure of students on FE modeling and simulation practices will help them gradually develop their modeling and simulation skills and be ready for the workplace, for the current workplace, for the current industry. And students can conduct experiments in a safe environment. Uh, we also know that uh, it's also very expensive to uh, invest in um, physical, in a physical, invest in a physical laboratory setup because um, we just don't know, maybe later on this uh, equipment can be uh, destroyed, it can be, uh, can be also unsafe for the student to work on without the support of uh, trained technicians. And we also know that probably it's not going to last its lifetime or um, probably it won't be applicable anymore. So it's probably good to conduct digital uh, testing or experimentation. So we also have the FEA and the CFD uh, modeling and simulation will enhance the learning of other courses such as structural dynamics, fluid mechanics, mechanical design, and heat transfer. Now, this will also promote critical analysis as well as uh, innovative mindset of the students. Now let's look at Bloom's taxonomy. Um, many of us would have already uh, learn about or heard about this Bloom's taxonomy. Of course, the lowest of the level of learning will be remembering and understanding, which uh, can happen through uh, online learning, synchronous or asynchronous, or a face-to-face -face lecture. But uh, to be able to move above the level of uh, higher learning, then they have to apply, experiment, design, analyze, evaluate, and create. Now, we also have Dale Cones of experience that uh, to be able to uh, know or say that the learners have understood 90% of the topic, they have to have a practical or practice in hands-on workshops, design collaborative lessons or activities. They can simulate model or experience and design perform a presentation or do the real thing, basically the real thing that's expected of them when they go to the industry. So most likely the uh, year two of the study or year one and year two of the new engineering curriculum will be focused more on understanding and applying. Um, we have year three to incorporate some of the application and analysis while in year four, we probably will see our uh, students to be analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Of course, not at high level, but at least we, we can see a bit of demonstration so that they will be uh, ready for the workplace. So aside from that uh, technical uh, skills that they have, they'll be able to develop uh, soft skills from this training. Now, I have listed here four uh, uh, possibilities on uh, integrating simulation in the curriculum. Um, I have used this uh, for um, uh, four ways uh, already in um, in the uh, University of Glasgow. Uh, in our um, program in the University of Glasgow, Singapore, I've used this four ways to integrate simulation in curriculum. So the first one is integration, integrating simulation in the uh, course that will help the uh, visualization of the phenomena, such as the stress displacement distribution and the fluid flow. Uh, we have the virtual lab bringing the laboratory home. Uh, we have tried this one, but it's not perfect, but we know that we have matched the uh, physical testing already and we have tried this one and we see the students to be uh, quite happy with the results. 
Um, we have also other standalone courses, which is the common one. This is the third uh, way, which is uh, providing standalone courses on FEA and CFD. This one is the traditional way of uh, incorporating a simulation in the engineering curriculum. And of course, uh, again, this one probably is also a common one wherein they are integrated in the design or analysis project. So we can um, say that this project-based learning um, or problem-based learning can be, uh, can be uh, uh, valuable in uh, improving their uh, critical skills as well as the design skills of the students. So this probably can be um, given to third and fourth year students. What I'm going to show will be integrating a simulation in the curriculum as well as um, the application of simulation in the final year projects of the students. Now, this one was uh, the course of Cornell University. So as you can see, they were able to uh, include the, uh, integrate the simulation in their uh, mechanical engineering courses. So that is the undergraduate courses, uh, mechanical structures, heat transfer, mechanical lab, thermofluids lab. So this is where um, the simulation will have an impact in their uh, education and they will prepare them for uh, the industry before they graduate. Uh, there will also be other uh, undergraduate or masters of engineering applications. Um, if it's too advanced for the undergraduates, then they can be presented in the masters or PhD. Now, this one is also a study to be able to um, satisfy the EBIT requirement. So uh, probably some of us already are familiar with the EBIT criteria. So as you can see, this one is a paper, a proposal, or a, a proposal presented in a paper in the American Society of Engineering Education. So as you can see, the mechanics of materials, vibration, heat transfer, CFD, uh, can be incorporated in the uh, engineering curriculum, or the uh, simulation can be incorporated in these um, courses, and eventually uh, can be uh, related to the other courses in the curriculum. And this is for the undergraduate course addressing the ABET criteria. Now this is um, what I have done. So for the uh, mechanics of deformable bodies, um, we can actually do some simple simulation uh, so that we can present this one to the students or probably they can also do this one with, for a start where they can have a hands-on uh, using the uh, software and trying to do some already uh, available CAD models for them and uh, use some simulation techniques to determine the stresses uh, as well as the deformation of simple engineering structures. And then compare this one with the analytical solutions. So we don't just encourage the use of formulas. We want them to uh, further use something that can help them uh, visualize what's going on to the structure. So this has influenced or enhanced the learning of mechanics of defor deformable bodies, or in my case, I call it mechanics of materials in my course through the use of FEA. So the students were able to visualize the deformation and stress contours within the structural members. Now, um, I'm going to move on to discuss some of the University of Glasgow Singapore final year projects using uh, FEA and CFD. Um, this one, because I wanted to be as much as possible close to the industry, this one was a partnership with some research institutes. So I have uh, partnered with the Department of Science and Technology in the Philippines, with the Philippine Coconut Authority and some consultants here in Singapore to be able to um, reduce that gap. So instead of the students just applying a simulation to uh, academic problems, they are now able to learn a bit or understand a bit the requirement of the industry. So this one is similar to the thesis um, that the undergraduates are doing in the Philippines. Uh, this one, by the way, is uh, an individual project. It's not a group project. So uh, we, we see the, the students here to be uh, really, they, they are being independent. We see some supervision uh, that were given by us supervisors, but we see more of the work to be done by the students. So let's have a look at this um, single cylinder diesel engine. This is a collaboration with the DOST. Um, and uh, for the FEA, we focus on that small bit there, which is the powertrain. So this one, we um, the, the student performed uh, static analysis developed 
uh, models to be able to come up with, um, to be able to understand the behavior um, within this uh, powertrain of a single cylinder engine. And uh, after that, um, the transient analysis model was developed so that while this uh, single cylinder engine was loaded, then we will be able to see the stresses as well as the deformation that act that is acting upon uh, that is acting on our um, uh, machine or to our component. Now there is this project also with the Department of Science and Technology. This one is a eco hydroelectric turbine, where uh, here our contribution or the students' contribution was in the improving the propeller. So this one, um, through the uh, simulation, the uh, weight of the propeller was reduced to three kilograms. That's quite a, a lot already. And um, the stress was reduced as well as the deformation. So we see those loads and boundary conditions as well as the meshing. And uh, we are now able to see the uh, contours of stresses as well as the deformation within our component. So with this one, we are able to come up or the student was able to come up with different variations to be able to reduce the stress, to reduce the deformation while decreasing the weight of the propeller. Now, this one is um, a model and a study by the student for the Philippine Coconut Authority. Um, the objective here is to be able to come up with a uh, to be able to come up with a desired uh, size of the chip because uh, the Japanese uh, market would like to have their uh, the sizes of the chips to be of a certain size. And uh, since they are uh, a good paying market, so um, ECA would like to address their concerns. So here we go. Um, through the uh, simulation, the student was able to come up with some recommendations on the speed as well as the angle of feed to um, the uh, chipper to be able to come up with the desired sizes of the chip or the desired sizes of the chips. Now, this one is um, a study with a consultant, shipping consultant in Singapore. So a study here is about a submersible uh, drill unit uh, which is in the offshore or located offshore. So we can see that the, uh, we can see that the uh, concern here is uh, what if the drills fall? You know, this one is in um, the offshore. We don't know where it's located. So we see that uh, safety really is a concern. So the concern is if this um, drill unit or the drill is going to fall, accidentally what's going to happen to the platform. So through this study, we are able to see what we are able to see the potential um, uh, effects if uh, the uh, drills, the drill is going to fall and what are the potential or possible uh, design changes that we can make to the platform so that it will become more safer or safer that is. And we have also this uh, CFD analysis that has been done by uh, my students whom I supervise. So we're still looking at the Pico hydroelectric. We're looking at the diesel engine. Uh, we're looking at solar dryers as well as uh, this uh, fluidized bed. But uh, there's also a thing here that I'm going to add. This one is um, a CFD done by my students and he was able to validate using a small scale prototype through the wind tunnel testing. So this one is a community of buildings in Singapore. And the student here developed a CFD model to be able to come up with some suggestion. Now this one is again with some with, with a uh, consultancy firm here in Singapore. Uh, they would like to know um, the uh, wind flow within this community of uh, buildings or this design community of buildings. So as you can see here, um, the simulation is quite uh, accurate, as you can say, when we compare with the small scale test. So we all see, uh, we are seeing a similar 
uh, trend here between the simulation model as well as the small scale test. And then uh, this one is another comparison and another one here. So we see a similar trend there. Okay. So um, there are many questions um, in the Philippines when I started presenting this uh, FEA um, or CFD application in the curriculum. Uh, lots of comments were mentioned. Students cannot do it, but I was able to uh, disprove that. I've tried um, high school students to follow the workshop. They were successful. So I don't think that the students or engineering students in the Philippines are not capable. So that was the first thing that was mentioned to me that the students cannot do it. So I was able to disprove that. Uh, the next probably is the concern on computers. So the computers, uh, I think that's a common problem and uh, this is not unique, but there is a solution uh, to that. So uh, I think the, the concerns that have been mentioned are basically, um, uh, they, they can be addressed. Uh, it's not something that's uh, going to be impossible to address, but they can easily be addressed. Uh, probably the thing here is we need to upgrade our faculty so that they will be able to understand, so that they will be able to uh, teach their students the use or the proper use of uh, simulation tools to the students. Uh, this one is a single cylinder engine, the uh, CFD analysis within the uh, cylinder engine. We can see that through the simulation, we are able to improve the flow within the uh, engine to have a better combustion and, of course, um, lesser carbon emission. Uh, this one now is, again, the um, uh, Pico hydroelectric turbine. So we can see that through simulation, uh, we are able to increase the velocity. Take note that we are uh, we are trying to harvest the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. So if we increase that velocity, that will be squared. And that's a lot of power that we can harvest. And uh, here with this one, we are also able to incorporate this one with uh, FEA so that we will be able to see what's going on to our propeller. So whether uh, we have a good um, velocity there, the question now is will our structure sustain that load. So um, we can incorporate both a CFD and FEA in our analysis. And this one is a solar dryer for our study with uh, PCA. So with the different configurations, we are able to come up with a configuration where the uh, drying will be uniform within the chamber. And this one is a fluidized uh, bed dryer. As you can see here, there's a, a from the start, we see that bulk of uh, grains there. That's that red part there. Okay, that's bulk. And then after some time, then uh, we see a spread. So the red here will be those grains. And we can see that uh, during the drying now it spreads. So uh, this one is uh, one of the um, one of the potential uh, applications of CFD in the agricultural sector. Um, these are my proposed activities. Uh, this one is uh, we need to work with industry to be able to identify their needs. Uh, we do that here in Singapore before we have this new program, um, the Singapore Institute of Technology and University of Glasgow joint program. We went out to the industry, did a, an industry scan and identified their needs. So our cur curriculum uh, basically was based on the needs of the current industry in Singapore. Um, we can have faculty training in FEA and CFD. We can also identify courses where FEA and CFD has the potential to improve the learning of the course. Uh, we can uh, conduct trial of CFD and FEA to some um, uh, course uh, classes. Uh, we can conduct surveys to evaluate the effectiveness of the uh, uh, integrated course, we can conduct student training to support them in their undergraduate thesis, and we can conduct a survey on skills learned. Now, when I was in the Philippines trying to discuss with other faculty in the Philippines, it seems it's common to, um, it seems it's, it's a common practice to ask students to pay a large amount of money to work on their thesis. I don't think that's really acceptable. We don't do that here. And, uh, you know, students are basically poor. 
they may be rich, but their family is rich because their family is rich. Uh, but uh, here in Singapore and in the UK, or even in the Australian program that I have taught, the students are basically poor and as much as possible, we don't want to burden them with high cost of doing their thesis. So in most cases, simulation can also be uh, a good alternative rather than doing the physical prototype. So with that said, uh, I really thank you very much for, I hope that uh, you are able to understand the um, importance of incorporating simulation in our engineering curriculum in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. My reference. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Now we are, op uh, we are on the open forum part of our webinar. Um, kindly uh, ask your question if you have any question. But sir, meron na pong nagpadala from uh, Mr. Armando D. Corpus from PSU. This, this is related in po dun sa, ano, sa, sa proposed activities, you know, faculty training in FEA and CFD. They're asking, what are the necessary trainings do mechanical engineers like us can take to learn the FEA, FEA and CFD simulations analysis? And can you suggest some training providers who can train mechanical engineers here in the country to learn simulations using FEA and CFD? Well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, thank you, sir, for that. Uh, my, uh, what I usually do is, um, well, this is based on my experience. That's why I came up with this strategy to be able to um, be able to share the knowledge of simulation in the Philippines. So when I started learning simulation or finite elements, I started with the theories. So both in the Philippines and in Singapore. Uh, at the end of this uh, courses, I passed, yeah, but the question is, how do we apply them? Because they're basically too theoretical that we just don't know how to apply them. But when I went to the industry, uh, I was able to know that you know using this uh, simulation tools would probably help us uh, learn faster. So my suggestion is to start first learning or appreciating the use of the tools available. So in my case, I'm an ANSYS user. ANSYS is one of the softwares. There is a free software, um, student software, that is also being used in Cornell University. So they're promoting the use of free softwares uh, of ANSYS. There's so many tutorials there. What I suggest is we can start first with um, learning the use of the softwares and tools. Once we learn that, then probably we go to the theory. So it's basically okay. an apprentice way, um, apprenticeship way of learning. So in learning the guitar, okay, if we're going to use that engineering concept of learning musical instruments, you teach all these uh, letters, all these um, keys and notes without even touching that guitar. But we know that's not effective. What's effective is touching that guitar while you're learning the theory. And that's probably more effective for us engineers as well. That's so nice. Yes. <laughs> okay, sir. I just really appreciate the idea that it is important for us to, to as somehow the new idea of teaching, which is to do it first before you understand the theory. Because at the end of the day, as a faculty, I have the tendency to give importance to the theory first before you could apply it. But, but this apprenticeship way of learning is somehow practical in, in a sense. So we will try that. Sir, um, um, my question is, can we, uh, regarding digital twin, can that we are trying to simulate or to have a digital copy of a physical system, can we also have a digital copy of the environment wherein we will subject that physical system? Yes, uh, we can do that too. So I think um, what's going to happen in a process or in a machinery, we can do that with the environment as well. I think um, this one is also being used by Pagasa. And I think we're, that, that's really helpful. Um, maybe say, for example, in Metro Manila, you have those building models, uh, just I've showed you one project of my students, and we can incorporate yeah. various wind conditions or maybe storm conditions to see what's going to happen. Yes, that's potential. Yes, that's possible. yes sir. I am asking that because I'm a, a student of energy engineering at the University of the Philippines, Deleman. And in energy, somehow it's really not practical to subject your, your prototype to the environment because of a lot of factors. So it's helpful for us if there is a simulation mechanism to subject our prototype first before we create our prototype. Right. 
Uh, I was coming from a wind energy um, in um, background. So I worked there as a principal engineer for four years. So that was the Vestas. That's the largest in the world. So yeah, we pretty much use a lot of simulation before we even do the prototype, both in CFD as well as the uh, FEA. Yes, sir. Uh, as per your discussion, it is 99% simulation and just 1% innovation. Innovation culture is that nowadays. Sir, there is another question here. Uh, from Sir Fernando A. Belarmino of URSC. Hi, sir. I have heard of concepts of design, thinking in other webinars, same goes with systems thinking, a webinar from AIM and in CS. We have agile development. Can we integrate the T concepts to all students? Where can I have maybe training or workshop for design thinking systems? Okay. Um, I'm also a fan of design thinking. So design thinking is uh, working with your customers, empathy, um, there's also this uh, coming up with concepts and prototyping. Um, physical prototyping is very expensive. So we can incorporate yes, that. Uh, and then we have to iterate, right? So from uh, uh, coming up with ideas, uh, prototyping, and then find the different ways to improve. So there's a cycle. So there's that uh, iteration there. So uh, through simulation, we can have, or we can iterate faster. Okay, yes, that's sir. where we can have that. In system thinking, uh, yes, I think this digital twin is about system. This is about systems. So we can uh, use simulation to uh, be able to integrate the systems. Like for example, I've shown um, the fluid structure interaction. So from the flow of the wind hitting a building, what will be that structure behavior after the wind is going to hit that building? So we're looking at an integration of analysis. Uh, in agile development, of course, you want fast, you want to fast fail, because uh, you want to further improve. So that's agile, it's about fast. So simulation will give you that information faster than the physical prototype. I know there are questions about the reality, how effective is simulation. Um, there are already many uh, technologies nowadays, many concepts to close that gap between reality and simulation. Again, that is one question that I usually get. So these are probably from people or from those who didn't really experience simulation. And the first thing to, um, to defend themselves from the use of simulation is to say, what is the difference between theory and simulation? Now theory itself will have about 20% difference with reality and that's from experience. 20% yes. you're already happy. So with simulation and uh, uh, physical uh, and uh, physical prototypes, if you get 20%, isn't that the same as the difference that's acceptable between theory and practice? Nice point, sir. And that is yeah. actually the, the answer to the question of Ms. Sherina Machas. Yes, uh, I, I, I hear a lot of this uh, discussion. So I've been traveling, giving presentations. I'm also a listener. And uh, these are very common uh, questions there. Yes, and sir. Uh, they can be addressed. As you can see, the simulation is trying to close that gap. Okay, that's why we have design thinking. We try to uh, go to the users, understand what they want, and we do a lot of iteration before we even develop that final product. And we factor those things in our design and model. Correct. Sir, um, uh, susugan ko lang po yung, yung discussion nyo regarding virtual laboratory. I think it is, um, nag take po kasi ako ng mga courses sa, sa Coursera, Thanks sa DUST Caraga. So, um, Nag-take nag po ko ng courses doon. And they actually, some universities really have their virtual laboratories also. And simulation is being done, not just in the MEN Civil, but in all engineering courses. And they have this environment wherein we have virtual, they have virtual laboratory. Uh, in, in your opinion, is must every university have their own virtual laboratory, especially during this time? that there is a potential for another pandemic or disasters that students can just be in their home and utilize a virtual laboratory and they still can learn. Yes, um, I, I really feel strongly about this one that we should have, each university should have their own program on developing virtual labs. Um, remember we had SARS before, probably uh, not too yes, much sir. in the Philippines, but uh, I was in Singapore and uh, we were all afraid. And we thought that was over and then we have this COVID pandemic. Um, but after the SARS, um, Singapore was able to 
uh, come up with an idea that it probably can happen again. So they did a lot on the digital learning of the students. They were prepared. I mean, not 100% prepared, but at least prepared than other countries in the world. So they were, and there, of course, Singapore is just small. So they can do that. Well, Philippines, of course, it's difficult to uh, have a similar approach. So um, yes, uh, I believe that uh, it's also now uh, a topic ongoing about uh, digital lab. So this is not just in the Philippines, uh, it's everywhere. Everybody's now talking about virtual lab. So um, I'm not thinking the COVID, but I think uh, with the COVID, we think them because this accelerated um, the um, digital learning for uh, a lot of uh, the schools. So regarding the, 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 the creation of a virtual lab, what is more advisable, hosting it in the cloud or hosting it locally in the university? Um, well, I cannot really say much about that at the moment. So a colleague of mine is looking into that. And um, uh, also my lab at the moment uh, for our, my, my students, we're hosting it at the university, so not in the cloud. I think there's still an issue about um, hosting it in the cloud. And still, there's also an issue if you host it in the university. So at the moment, I really don't have any opinion about that. But um, yes, in my case, my, I'm, I'm proposing to have bringing the laboratory at home, meaning that if you have that simulation model, so the simulation will be, um, well, the student can create it. They will have that uh, capability on developing that simple model, or we just try to send them the model so they can play around with that. So um, I think that the concern here is uh, the, the computer, the availability of the computer to the students. But I do hope that the universities will have their uh, own computers as well if that is an issue. The good thing about CFDs and FEAs are, are, as you said, there are softwares that are open and free and the students could just download them. So another right. question from... Giancarlo Ramos, in the use of CFD and FEA, are there common codes that will be already ap applied to get the simulations we want to see or applicable tabs or we need to make codes and to make that simulations more reliable? Yeah. Um, so based on my experience, uh, when I started learning simulation, I have to develop my own code. Um, and then uh, mm. when I went to the industry, I think it's basically useless. The, the okay. thing that I learned in simulation is basically the limit of um, FEA and CFD. So I have to take into consideration when I use the um, CFD, FEA codes or uh, softwares. Now, there are many uh, good um, softwares available there. Uh, many of them are also free or um, there can be commercial softwares. They will provide some free student licenses. It's limited, but it's al already good for us to learn the different um, or to learn how to model. Um, so I think we had codes. So codes uh, probably for higher level, that's where you really develop codes for research. If the uh, current software is, um, is not uh, capable on, uh, on, on simulating the uh, detailed problem that you, or specific problem that you want to understand, then some of these softwares will have that um, capability or capacity where you can incorporate the uh, codes that you made. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, that ends our open forum. Um, to give the synopsis, may I call on the Director of Intellectual Property Management Office, Dr. Gino L. Andres. Okay, hello. Yes, sir. Ah, okay, lang. Hello, uh, good morning, Dr. Delia. Morning, sir, Gino. So first and foremost, I am truly honored uh, to be hearing such a very informative presentation, uh, specifically coming from an established uh, researcher like Dr. Delia, Christian Delia. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, so to give the synopsis of today's talk, uh, Dr. Delia talked about the importance of computational fluid dynamics, which can be used to simulate a fluid motion and heat transfer using numerical approaches. The speaker also mentioned the digital twin technology, wherein the technology enables connectivity between the physical component and its digital counterpart. The speaker showed us information on the current status of science and technology migration 
wherein uh, he mentioned 42.05% of Filipinos are working abroad related science and technology. So the speaker also tackled about the contribution of engineering services outsourcing, which mainly refers to outsourcing of work related to design and development, such as drafting of entry d modeling, uh, engineering analysis, product design and testing, design automation, control system engineering, manufacturing engineering, embedded in embedded system and design or process engineering. Moreover, the speaker asked about simulation driven engineering concept in which the knowledge and skills needed to be able to develop a reliable perform analysis. elaborated the importance of integrating simulation in engineering curriculum, which could largely uh, learning of civil engineering and mechanical engineering courses in particular, uh, expose students on finite modeling and simulation. Students can conduct experiments in safe environment and apply FE CFD modeling and simulation to enhance learning of other courses. Furthermore, Dr. Delia demonstrated the sample data using integrated simulation curriculum in mechanical engineering. He also showed simulation driven designs utilizing CFD and FEA modeling and computational analysis. Finally, he proposed activity or strategies on how are we going to integrate simulation in engineering curriculum. So with that, uh, thank you, Dr. Delia, for your uh, wonderful and very informative. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andres. To award the certificate of recognition, may I call on the co-chair of the professorial shareholder lecture series Engineer Jose Linda M. Golpeo. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, this certificate of recognition is given to Dr. Christian N. Delia in grateful acknowledgement of his distinguished and invaluable service rendered as guest of honor and speaker in the science, engineering, and technology professorial chairholder lecture series 2020. So enhancing engineering education through simulation-based learning. So given this sixth day of November 2020 at the PUP main campus, Santa Mesa, Manila, Philippines. Signed, Dr. Manuel M. Muni, University President. So Dr. Delia, accept po yung virtual uh, certificate of recognition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank uh, PUP um, for giving me this opportunity um, to be able to share what I know. And uh, I'm hoping that there will be more collaborations in the future uh, when it comes to the use of uh, simulation in our engineering curriculum in the Philippines. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Delia. Thank you, Dr. Delia. We would also like to thank our participants in this webinar. Um, we would like to acknowledge the President of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Manuel Amui, sir. Um, good morning. Um, faculties from Cavite State University, University of Rizal System, Cainta, Iris, Biliran Province State University, FEU, LGU Baguio, PIP Manila, 
Vice and NIA Subchapter, Holy Cross College Santa Ana, Pampanga, National University, University of the Philippines Los Baños, PIIEP PSC, University of Antique, PSME Davao, Filska, Pangasinan State University, and Filska. Thank you everyone for participating and may you participate again on our future professorial lecture series. So um, here is the evaluation link. Evaluation form will be available only from this point on until 11.59 p.m. today. For those who was not able to answer the evaluation link for the previous sessions, please send proof of your attendance to pchls at pup.edu.ph. Thank you. And these are our future events. We have a professorial lecture chair series by Dr. Gashano P. Yumul Jr. discussing about minerals industry, basics of exploration, mining, and milling operations in November 13, 2020. We also have, again, a professorial lecture chairs holder, uh, professor chairholder lecture series by Dr. Delia discussing piezoelectric composites on November 20, as well as Dr. Ryan S. Evangelista discussing introduction to cloud, the future of mo modern computing, also November 20, 2020. Next. And, and on December 11, 2020, Dr. Ryan S. Evangelista will discuss IT project management in the globalized society. Next. To give her closing remarks, please welcome the Dean of the College of Engineering, Dr. Remedios G. Addo. Hi. To all our online viewers, to Dr. Christian Delia, to the PUP officials, especially to our president, Dr. Manuel Muhi, faculty, staff, students, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This fourth lecture series webinar is another milestone to our Sintang Paaralan, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Through our speaker, you are able to feel and experience online interactions with Dr. Delia, who is in Singapore, and the participants here in Philippines. It gives us the sense of presence even though we are geographically apart. After this webinar, maybe we can make use some of the topics discussed by Dr. Delia about enhancing engineering education through simulation-based learning, the digital twin market is growing as part of Industry 4.0, just like in the engineering service outsourcing and complexity spectrum. You must also consider the key factors for choosing an ESO destination from a business perspective. We can consider the Bloom's taxonomy and Dale's cone experience, simulation, virtual laboratory, standalone course, and design or analysis projects can be our practice in our online classes during this time of pandemic. Lastly, we would like to congratulate the organizers of this lecture series headed by AVPSS Engineer Flor Aquindo and Co-Chair Engineer Golpeo and to all the team members. Thank you to the participants for joining us in this fourth lecture series. Hope to see you again in our next online session. Have a good day. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Addo. Um, we would also like to acknowledge the faculties from University of Northern Philippines from the beautiful city of Digan. Uh, this is, uh, we are now having a photo opportunity. Kindly open your video feed so as we could take our pictures. This would take long because we have 161 participants. So kindly wait for a few minutes. We can count for up to 100. Sleeping tools doesn't say. Okay na? Okay na. Sir, saan yung ano dito, sir?
Okay, ready po tayo, Gallery 1. Okay, so ready. 1, 2, 3, smile. Okay. Correct. Okay, next po. Ay, wait lang. Okay, next po. Smile po tayo. Ready? One, two, three. Smile. Okay, next side po. Next gallery. Ready? One, two, three. Smile. Okay, next gallery po. Ready? One, two, three. Smile. Okay. Next gallery po. Ready? One, two, three. Smile. Okay, so last gallery na po ito. So ready? One, two, three. Smile. Okay. So okay na po. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge, sorry for this, um, the faculties from National, Nueva uh, Ecija University of Science and Tech and Northwestern University of Lawag City. Now, can you join us? in singing the favorite song of every PUP PUP hymn. And we're done. Thank you, everyone. See you on our next professorial chair lecture series. Thank you, Dr. Delia. See you next time, Paul. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.